Labdien cienījamās dāmas un godātie kungi. Es priecājos jūs šodien šeit sveikt Rīgas domas sēžu zālē. Mans vārds ir Ruta Klimkāne un es pārstāvu Rīgas domas labklājības departamentu. Šodien mēs esam pulcējušies, lai klausītos vieslekciju, ko mums piedāvās Lance Gardner kungs no Lielbritānijas, kurš tātad pastāvstīs par savu pieredzi sociālajā uzņēmēja darbībā, kur ir izpildirektors sociālajā uzņēmumā Social Care Group. Šī vieslikcija notiek pateicoties vai pēc Soros fonds Latvijas iniciatīvas, kur tātad uzrunāja Rīgas domas labklājības departamentu, par iespēju uzaicināt mūsu vieslektoru, kam mēs ar gandarījumu piekritām un pateicamies arī Rīgas domē par iespēju šo sanāksni novadīt tieši šeit, šajās talpās, kas ir ļoti piemērotas šādām tikšanās reizēm. Un es novēlu visiem mums šodien ļoti radošu dienu, runājot par tēmu, kas ir aktualizējusies ne tikai Latvijā, bet arī Eiropā, kad droši vien pateicoties vai, diemžēl, krīzei, kas bija skārusi un atstāja savas sekas, parādot to, ka ir nepieciešami jauni risinājumi iniciatīvas pieejas gan uzņēmēja darbībā, gan sociālajā jomā, lai risinātu tādas problēmas kā nabadzība, sociālā iekļaušana, nodarbinātība. Un tāpēc tiešām vēlu visiem ļoti radošu šo darbu. Darbu kārtībā mēs varam redzēt, ka strādāsim šodien līdz pus diviem, tā tad ieskaitot arī kafijas pauzi. Būs pieejams tā tad arī tulkojums. Augšā jūs varat redzēt, ka pirmais kanāls tā tad ir latviešu valodai un otrais ir angļu valodai. Jautājums mēs uzdosim pēc lekcijas. Ieslēdzot tā tad mikrofonu, to es varbūt vēlreiz visu izstāstīšu, bet tagad es gribētu dot vārdu, lai atklātu tā tad šo lekciju Rīgas domas sociālu jautājumu komitejas priekšsēdētāji Olgai Veidiņas kundzei. Lūdzu. Labdien, godātie kolēdzi, man ir ļoti liels prieks, ka šodien mums ir tik liela interese pa mūsu lekciju, jo Rīga strādā ar 36 nevalstiskām organizācijām, iepērk pakalpojums arī no valsts, un mums ir ļoti daudz darams sociālā jomā, jo neskatoties uz to, ka mēs gribētu darīt to visu labāk, ir vajadzīga tās labās pieredzes apmaiņa, lai mēs varētu arī varbūt vairāk mainīt mūsu visas struktūras, lai dot vairāk iespējas uzņēmēja darbības attīstībai sociālā jomā, lai mēs varētu panākt lielāku pienākumu cilvēku labklājībai, varētu iesaistīt vairākus cilvēkus bezdarbniekus normālam darbam un attīstīt arī citu sociālo pakalpojumu grupu. Es šodien jums visiem un man arī novēlu veiksmīgu lekcijas noklausīšanu, un tālāk mēs visas strādāsim pie ar jūsu priekšlikumiem, kuras mēs arī uzklausīsim, apvienosim un tad mēģināsim iet pie kaut kādiem kopējiem darbiem. Tātad jums visiem veiksmīgu darbu sākam klausīt lekciju un apmainīties ar mūsu pieredzēm. Paldies jums visiem! Pirms ķercimies pie lekcijas vēl dažu vārdu no mans puses. Labdien, dāmas un kungi, es esmu Jo Mauritz, Sarasvonda Latvija programma direktore. 
Un uh, man būs tas gods šodien jūs iepazīstināt ar Lansu Gārdneru kungu. Uh, bet pirms tam tiešām sirsnīgi pateicību no Saras Fonda Latvijas puses Rīgas domēji uh, par atvērtību un atsaucību šīs lekcijas rīkošanā, kā arī Gārdneru kunga vizītes rīkošanā Latvijā. Un īpaša pateicība arī Rīgas domas labklājības departamentam uh, Mārtiņam Mora kungam un Rutai Klimkānes kundzei uh, par ieinteresētību atbalstīt un veicināt sociālo uzņēmē darbību ne tikai Rīgā, bet arī Latvijā, jo šeit ir cilvēki, gan no Viļāniem, gan no Ventspils, gan no daudzām citām Latvijas pilsētām. Un mēs novērtējām, ka jūs veltījāt savu laiku un uh, transportu un, 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 un darba dienu tam, lai dodos uz Rīgu un uh, izmantot šo iespēju mācīties par sociālo uzņēmē darbību. Uh, Lans Gārdner kungs ir 34 gadus uh, strādājis Lielbritānijas nacionālajā veselības dien, dienestā. Uh, viņa profesija ir medbrālis, un pat laban viņš ir izpildi direktors uh, sociālajam uzņēmumam Care Plus grupa, uh, kas ir salīdzinoši liels uh, sociālais uzņēmums ar 800 darbiniekiem un vairāk kā 28 miljoniem eiro apgrozījumu gadā. Gārdner kunga vadītājs uzņēmums kļuva par sociālo uzņēmumu trīs gadus atpakaļ, atdaloties no Nacionālā veselības dienestu un no pašvaldības. Un tā kā Gārdner kungam ļoti ātri nācās iemācīties, kā tad ir vadīt vienu uzņēmumu, vadīt vienu biznesu. Un tā izskatās, ka tas viņam arī veiksmīgi izdodās. Gārdneri kungam es vakar vaicāju, nu, vai viņš varētu man uh, pāris lietas par sevi pateikt, uh, ko viņš gribētu, lai es jums pasaku. Un viņš bija ļoti kautrīgs un pieticīgs, tā kā es pati paskatījos internetā mazliet vairāk par viņu, jo viņš neatklāja visu savas labās lietas. Uh, uh, bet tā viena lieta, ko viņš man pateica, ka viņa vadmatījus uh, Nacionālajā veselības dienestā vienmēr ir bijis radīt tādu uh, primārās aprūpes sistēmu, kas vienlīdz augstu vērtē gan medicīnisko personālu, gan arī pacientus, un arī pat laban uh, vadot viņa uzņēmumu, viņš vienlīdz augstu vērtē visus, gan savus darbiniekus, uh, gan arī vietējos iedzīvotājus, gan arī viņa uzņēmuma klientus. Gārdner kungs ir precējies, viņam ir trīs bērni, divi mazbērni un suns. Sunies redzēja internetā, kad mēs runājām skaipas sarunā. Un Gārdner kungs uzskata, ka cilvēki paši vienmēr zin risinājumus savām problēmām, bet viņiem ir jāiedod rīki, kas palīdz šīs problēmas atrisināt. Un man šķiet, ka sociālā uzņēmē darbība tiešām ir viens tas rīks, kā atbildību par cilvēku dzīvi un nodot arī pašas sabiedrības rokā. Sociālā uzņēmē darbība palīdz sabiedrībai kļūt atvērtākai, iekļaujošākai un ilgtspējīgākai. Un vēl divi interesanti fakti par Gārdner kungu. 2000. gadā viņam tika piešķirts uh, augsts uh, Brita imperijas apbalvojums, Brita imperijas ordenis uh, par ieguldījumu primārajā aprūpē. Bet tā interesantā lieta, ka Gārtneru kungam nav savs kabinets. Viņam nav savu kabinete, jo viņš uzskata, ka viņam ir jārunā ar cilvēkiem, un ja viņam vajag piesaisties pie galda, tad viņš piesiešās pie savu sekretāras galda. Bet pārējā laikā viņš iet runā ar cilvēkiem, saviem darbiniekiem un klientiem. Uh, Ir uh, tāds, tāds uzskats, ka sociālā uzņēmē darbība savā ziņā apvienotos labākos elementus no biznesa pasaules un no labdarības pasaules. Nu, ja mēs tā tēlaini varētu teikt, tas būtu tā kā aprecināt Māti Terēzi un Richardu Brensonu. Nu, paskatīsimies, kā tas uh, Lansam Gārdneram ir izdevies viņa darbā. Uh, paldies par uzmanību un patīkām klausīšanos. Lepdien, priektijos būt Riga. I'm sorry, that's the end of the Latvian. I apologize, I'm a nurse, not a technician. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to your beautiful city and your beautiful country. I've spent most of the last two days just walking around, looking at buildings and in heaven. And just your city is absolutely outstanding. Um, I've been asked to speak to you about social enterprise and about 
how we came to be where we are. You're wondering why I'm showing you a photograph of a tin can. In 1833, George Durant, an Englishman, invented the tin can. And since that time, tin cans revolutionized the ability to store food safely. Before that time, it was either dried or going rotten. But the tin can produced this method to secure, securely and safely store food. And as a result of that, he saved millions and millions of lives through famines, wars, all sorts of, of, of problems were saved by the tin can. So that's nearly 200 years ago. It's 190 odd years. And it's worked. And it works really, really well. So imagine a, imagine a conversation where there's this big executive team and they, in the, there's a company in the UK called Metalbox and they make tin cans, billions of them. And you can imagine this senior management meeting and there's always one member of the senior management team who, nobody, who never speaks and he just sits there and he comes every week and he does his work but nobody really knows who he is and nobody knows what he does. And imagine the conversation. So at the end of the meeting, when it gets to any other business... This man suddenly speaks, puts his hand up. The chief executive says, he can't even remember his name, but says, yes, and he said, I've had an idea. And he said, well, what's the idea? And he said, why don't we make square tin cans? And he said, square tin can? Why would you want to make square tin cans? Tin cans have been the same for 200 years since George developed them. If they work, why would you change them? And this man says, because a square tin can takes up 33% less space in our warehouse. And if it takes up 33% less space in our warehouse, it takes up 33% less space in the supermarket, and it takes up 33% less space on the shelf, and it takes up 33% less space in the shopping basket, therefore they can buy more. So then you start to change things that have gone on the same forever. They do exist. The model was taken on. Now, I don't know whether there's any engineers in the audience, but you will tell me, I know the answer, why they aren't everywhere. And there is an answer. But it's just about somebody trying to break the pattern of just doing it the same old way for 200 years and you just keep going. Somebody having the, the bravery and the courage to try and do it a different way. There are three kinds of entrepreneurs who you will all recognize. The market entrepreneurs, the guys who, you know, they own those beautiful houses I saw as I flew in yesterday by the beach. And they see an opportunity and they grasp it and they just go with it. And they know there's a risk and they fail about nine out of ten times. But on the tenth time when they get it right, they make millions and millions of euros. And we all know they are, and they're, they're famous throughout the world. But they don't necessarily give a lot back. The civic entrepreneurs are the people like Andreas, can't see him now, oh, he's up there, and, and Martins and your colleagues here who take public money and do the best they can with it to make things better for citizens. And then we have social entrepreneurs, and these are people like you, who have an idea. And that idea might have absolutely nothing to do with society. It might be that the big social enterprises in the UK make chocolate. But it's what they do with their profits that matters. With that profit, they manage schools, they run hospitals in all parts of the world, they save lives in Africa, they create water systems, but they sell chocolate. And that's where the social entrepreneur sees an idea for any kind of business. But it's what their social good they want to return. And there are three kinds of returns. There's a financial return, which is the top one. Market entrepreneur are only interested in the social financial return. 
The second level is the social return. So how is this better for society? And that's what the civic entrepreneurs do and the social entrepreneurs do. And then the third one is, is environmental. It's no good being a social entrepreneur if you're polluting rivers and causing destruction on, you know, in communities. So we call it three levels. There's three bottom lines, financial, social, environmental. This is the, as close to a British definition as we've ever got to. And there isn't really one. We, we've never all agreed one. But it's a business that trades with a social and or environmental purpose. A business with primarily social objectives whose surpluses are principally reinvested for that purpose in the business or in the community, rather than being driven by the needs to maximise profits for shareholders and owners. And actually, that's a government statement. The DTI is the Department of Trade and Industry in the UK. So more about us. We're Care Plus Group, as you can see up there. Um, and I tried to give you some geographical context. Um, so we're a long way from London, basically. About 300 kilometres north of London. And we're tiny. You can see the small green area. That's us, surrounded by huge municipalities. But we're really tiny. Um, and the good thing about being 300 kilometres from London is that the government don't care about us and don't know where we are and means we can do what we like and nobody's bothered. Uh, so we're quite independent. We're used to getting by on our own. But we work really well with our municipality. So how did we get to become a social enterprise? Well, I've been involved in social enterprise for about 12 years, but I only knew I was a social entrepreneur about five years ago. And having spoken to Andreas last night at Samaritans, he was the same. You do it, and then somebody says, you're a social entrepreneur, and you go, really? Uh, okay. Um, so I've been involved in trying to use employees and citizens to change the world. But we start really small. And then our government embraced this and in introduced something called the right to request. And what happened was a very senior politician in the National Health Service in the UK went out and interviewed hundreds of doctors and nurses. And what they told him was that the National Health Service would be much, much better if there weren't ministers like him and there weren't as many managers and if they could run it themselves because they could do it better than everybody else. So he said, go on then. So he created a law called the right to request, which enabled doctors and nurses to say, I want the right to try and run our service as a new business, as a social enterprise. And so that's what we did. And there were 57 of us across the whole of the UK, and we were worth now about... Uh, a billion euros between the 57 of us. And some are really tiny, so they are five employees and 120,000 euros. And some are really, really big. Uh, 100 million pounds turnover, uh, euros turnover and 3,500 employees and everything in between. Uh, when we all provide community services and only now are we beginning to look at that we're going to provide hospital services. When you stand in front of hundreds of doctors and nurses and say, we've done it like this since 1947, which is when the National Health Service was invented, but now we're going to change it. And you're going to own it yourself and we're going to run off and we're going to do it completely differently. They don't all jump for joy. They get really, really scared. And that's okay. Being frightened of this kind of change is okay. But you've got to, it's about keeping the message. So they have to see that I believe it, even though I sometimes have doubts, but they don't know that. But the leadership is the capacity to translate that vision into a reality. 
Now, when we became a social enterprise three years ago, the only thing that mattered was, will our wages be in our bank accounts in four weeks' time? Nothing else. It was the one thing that we knew we had to get right. Didn't matter what else we did to them, as long as those wages were in those bank accounts on the right day and they were right. So we cancelled managers leave, we cancelled everything to make sure every single one of those pay slips was right on that day. And we got three wrong out of 800. And everybody went, Phew. And we've been all right ever since because we got that one bit right. Because that was the one test that the employees gave us. So we are a social enterprise. We're approaching our third birthday. And interestingly, when I tell you I stood in front of audiences like you amongst our own staff and our own people and said, this is what it's going to look like, it doesn't. <laughs> you, you couldn't say what it was going to look like in three years' time. It's evolved, it's changed. But that's the beauty of being a social enterprise. We just move with what's ever going on. And we can. We don't have to go and ask anybody's permission. We are slightly different from you in the way the Latvian system, and in fact we are unique in the UK, which is back to our geography, in that we have a fully integrated health and social care system. So your Department of Welfare here does their bit, and your state does the health bit. We deliver everything on a single budget but we still use a state contract. I hope that made sense. Okay. We started with 720 staff. The figure in brackets is how many we've got now. So we're in the midst of the worst recession in history, and I know that's hit you as hard as it's hit us, and yet we're growing. We're growing jobs in a town with high unemployment. So our unemployment in our town is about 18%. We are a seaside town, um, and we're on the road to nowhere. So nobody comes to our town unless you've got to. It's not on its way to somewhere else. If you come in, you need to come for a good reason. And it was based on a traditional shipping, fishing industry. Um, we used to have in the... 1980s, there were 600 trawlers, deep sea trawlers. There's now six. Massive unemployment, and nothing has replaced that industry until just recently. And now that industry that's replacing that is wind turbines. So we've got 300 wind turbines in the sea, just off or just off offshore, and we're creating new industries about looking after wind turbines. And it's about care. So we care for people in Care Plus Group. And our new engineers are caring for wind turbines because that's the new future. We started with 26 million euros. We're now on 28 and a half million euros. So although we're in austerity, we're still growing. Slowly, but we're growing, not shrinking. We serve a population of about 156,000, which is about 20% of the size of Riga. I don't know whether the next one works for you, but, but international standards is a quality measure that's across the world. ISO 9001, 14001, which is environmental, and 27001, which is IT. Um, nobody in the National Health Service has ISO 9001. Nobody's ever qualified for it. Nobody's qualified for 27001, which is IT. We have. We're the first ever care providers to, to win that award in the UK. We run 35 different services. This is just a selection. I don't know whether you have something similar to intermediate tier, but that's for people who are too sick to stay at home on their own, but not sick enough to be in a hospital. So we care for them in a different way. So we put a lot of support into keeping them at home. Or we have facilities that are more like a home, but where there's 24-hour care. So that's what intermediate tier stands for. We have community nursing. We have home care. I know you do have home care. You have home care in a bus. Well, Andreas does. He's been showing me his pictures. I'm jealous. We have specialist nurses for diabetes, epilepsy, uh, wounds, things like that. 
We also do a lot of work with drug and alcohol, and that's not paid for, that's paid for out of criminal justice um, by our home office. It's not paid for by health, it's not paid for by municipality, that's part of criminal justice. Employability is we run three employment agencies, so we create jobs, because we see that giving somebody a job is just as important as giving somebody care, particularly in a town like ours. So we have a responsibility to create work, and we create work for people who don't normally get work. In our town, we have 364 children between 8 and 21. I know 21's a bit old for a child, but bear with me who deliver care to an adult every day. So they care for their own parents. They're not being parented in the way that you would do parenting when we love our children. These are children delivering care for sick parents. It's not a nice place to be. It's not a good way for young people to grow up. And they often fail in their education they fail to meet their aspirations. They don't have aspirations. All they know is to care. And all they know is they have to look after their mother or their father or their sister or whatever. But they've got a set of skills that I desperately need. They know how to care. Now, I know Latvia know about football because you know about our football. And one of my passions that Ava missed out was football. And every bar I've walked in, my veneer has got football on. Or soccer. Anyway, football. Barcelona know every seven-year-old in Europe who can kick a football in a straight line. And what they do is they then track that child and keep an eye on that child to see how his footballing skills develop. And when he gets to 10 or 12, they give him a contract so that he belongs to Barcelona. And then when he gets to 15, 16, they support him through his education and then they turn them maybe into footballers or maybe just let them go. What we've done is we've created a care academy with our university. So what we now do is we give contracts of employment to 12-year-olds who know how to care. So these children who know how to care, we're saying to them at 12, when you're 18, here is a job. I promise you, here is a job today. All you've got to do is do your best. So you will go to school. So instead of getting up in the morning and thinking, can't go to school today because mum's not very well, that's not your responsibility. That's my responsibility. So when you get up in the morning and your mum's not well, you ring Care Plus group, and we will go and look after mum, you go to school. And we give that child a mentor who supports them through their education and supports them through some of the really difficult times of adolescence and being a carer. And then at 18, we give them a job, no matter what. No questions asked. We just give them a job as a carer because that's how we create a future for these people. And I need a workforce. So it's working for me, and it's working for them, and it gives them hope. Uh, we also employ quite a lot of mature people. You know, 50 going on 25, <laughs> who've been long-term unemployed, but we're getting them back into the workforce, because they've got skills. And we do that on behalf of the municipality, on behalf of the police. We do that on behalf of lots of other organisations. So we've taken that role on, on behalf of everybody else. Meals on Wheels, I understand that you will get. So we deliver hot meals to vulnerable people every day. But we don't just deliver a hot meal every day. We get paid to deliver a hot meal. And if we were going to be a market entrepreneur... That's all we would do. So you drop that meal off and you walk out. But if you're a social entrepreneur, what you do is you have a look at the person that you're giving that dinner to. And did they eat yesterday's? Is it in the bin? Is it just still sat there where you left it? Are they okay today? Did they take their medication? It's quite dark in this room. Have to, has the light bulb gone? And they don't know how to change the light bulb. And there's no capacity to change the light bulb. We'll change the light bulb. 
And it's okay delivering their lunch, but what do they do for breakfast and what do they do for tea? So we're going, so what we said to them is, if we're coming to your house to deliver your lunch, would you like us to deliver your breakfast as well? And would you like us to deliver your evening meal? And because we're coming anyway, we will charge you just the cost of the meal, nothing else. So we will do your evening meal for one euro. We will do your breakfast for 50 cents because we're coming anyway. And that way we keep people independent. So when we started three years ago, everybody, every penny we got for Meals on Wheels was from the municipality. Now, 50% of our clients pay for us to come and deliver their meals or their tea or their breakfast well, what we now do is, if you receive a hot meal every day from us or from the municipality, then that means you don't need to shop, so your cupboards are bare. And then when your grandchildren and your children visit you at the weekend, it makes you feel bad as a, as a person because you can't feed them. And I know how hospitable Latvians are, having been here for a couple of days. And so the thought of you having a guest and not being able to give them anything, food-wise or hospitality, must be awful. So now what we do is, what we say to our older people is, if you know your grandkid children are coming at the weekend, tell us and we will bring you a party. We'll bring you a load of food for young people and children and you will look really, really good to your grandkids. The other thing that service does is we deliver... Um, as I say, we deliver people's meals. But that means that they don't get out of their home. And so they're socially isolated. So then we said, what if we did your shopping for you and you did your own? Because that's more important, that you keep those life skills. So it's more important you make your own dinners, not that we make your dinners. So can we help you to make your own dinners? What if we brought you shopping? Better still, what if we took you shopping? What if we actually picked you up in a vehicle and we took you to the supermarket... And you did your, and we helped you to do your own shopping. And then you meet other people and you get out of the house. This week we will take 587 people shopping. And we do that every week. And we take them all at once in buses. And it's a riot. It's just... We're banned from a couple of supermarkets. Because <laughs> um, we take all these old people together. But they now are starting to meet up. So they make plans to meet the people that they met last week. And so now, when they've finished shopping, they go dancing. Or they go to bingo. Yes, bingo. Oh, okay. They go, or the cinema. This is a very British term, but they are also courting. Yes, no. On the pull. Um, getting partners, Okay. We've got some. We, we we recently did a survey on um, sexual health across our population, and we got more returns from the over sixties than we did from everybody else. So you'll see that we do chlamydia screening because <laughs> we have to look after them. We invite. We we started this, so now we have to make sure they're safe. These are our core values, and we agreed these, but actually these core values are the state's core values. When the NHS, National Health Service, was invented in 1947, um, under the, what was called the Health and Welfare Act, it set out a set of values. It was the first time that health care and social care was free to everybody, and it was the same no matter, for every citizen. We took those 1947 values into our business. So we are still delivering those original values about why the National Health Service in the UK is so good. And actually, we're there to protect them. So we're protecting that heritage that we really, really believe in. So all of our staff sign up to these. I'm aware that we... I've just remembered. We've got some visually impaired colleagues in the room. I didn't read them out. So that it meets the needs of everyone, that it is free of the point of delivery wherever possible, 
that it is based on need, not ability to pay, that it's a comprehensive range of services, that it shapes its services around the needs and preferences of individuals, their families and their carers, and will respond to different needs in different populations. We don't necessarily get paid for the stuff that we do. So the shopping trips, we don't charge for that, and we don't get paid to do that. But we've got 22 buses, and we've got 22 bus drivers, and the municipality pays for them to take people to day services and daycare. But daycare invariably starts at about half past nine in the morning and finishes about half past three in the afternoon, and meanwhile the bus drivers were sat doing nothing. So they said, why don't we use these buses to do better things? Why don't we use these buses to take people to the cinema, to take people dancing, to take people shopping? So it came from them. So it's not paid for as such. It's not commissioned. It's part of being social good, and it came from the individuals. I'm going to skip this one. Those of you that understand English really well will get that. Those of you that don't, I'm just going to skip it. But the irony is that we have left the state system to protect the state system. This is our mission statement. Um, a very big international global business management firm called Deloitte came and looked at our business and they said our mission statement was rubbish. And we said, we don't care because we like it and it matters to us, not you. So we are the provider of choice and we're the provider of choice on four levels. One, that our staff want to work for us. We do a staff survey, and 86% of our staff would recommend us to other people to work for. Across the UK, there is a massive survey that's done of all public sector municipality staff to say, and it's a very big survey, and it's a bit clumsy, but one of the questions is, would you be happy for your friends and family to be cared for by your own organisation? And across the municipalities and the National Health Service, the answer is less than 50% say yes. In Care Plus Group, that's 90%. And in all of the social enterprises that deliver care, it's 90%. We are so different. Our staff absolutely buy into what we're trying to do. We are also committed to our citizens, so we're not running off trying to get new work here, there and everywhere. We're committed to our town. 92 cents in every euro that we earn is spent within our town. Our financial orders say that when we're buying anything, toilet roll, clinical products, an electrician... We must buy in our town first if we can. So all our tradesmen are local. And if there isn't a tradesman local, we train one because we can guarantee them the work. Our population, our citizens, see that we care about them and we are part of them. Most of our staff live amongst them and have grown up amongst them. So when you ask our citizens who do they want to deliver their services, they say Care Plus Group. Not some big multinational private company that's faceless or Walmart or any of the Debenhams. I know you've got one of those. They want it from local people that they trust. When you've got staff who want to work for you, staff who believe in the care they're delivering, and, a, and the citizens who understand that that's what you're about, it makes the commissioner's job and the municipality's job really easy to commission. Because all everything's stacked up ready to make this win. And the outcomes come with that. For those of you that understand English, you'll get that slide. For those of you that don't, this is a really serious slide, but it does just break up a boring lecture. So for those of you also that are visually impaired, 
the gentleman is saying to his wife, whatever happened to our sexual relations? And she says, I don't know. I don't think we got a Christmas card from them this year. Why am I showing you that slide? Because I show that slide on every presentation I do anywhere in the world, including every time I stand up in front of my own team. And I make no apology for that. And the reason is that the incidence of rape and sexual assault in the over 70s is now much worse than child abuse numbers. And it's because of dementia. The incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease is going up across the Western world, including Latvia, by 50% every five years. The problem that creates, and the reason I show the last slide is, one of the side effects of dementia, sadly, is that for the dementia sufferer, their inhibitions drop and their libido goes up, but their partner's doesn't. And they don't understand when he or she says no. And we don't want to talk about it, and we don't want to believe it's happening, but it's happening. And we have a responsibility as a society to acknowledge that these things are happening. Dementia care is going to change our societies in ways we cannot imagine in the next 20, 20 years. And that's not just the UK, that's here in Latvia, that's across the world. Dementia numbers and th those needs are absolutely going to change the way that we need to deliver that work. And being a social enterprise makes that easier. I understand that there is not a law, a company law in Latvia, that creates a social enterprise. That's a shame. But think on, at least you're not British. We've got 34. So we have 34 different ways of setting up a social enterprise. The lawyers are making a lot of money. Sorry, girls. <laughs> a lot of lawyers at the back. Um trying to explain it. Actually, it's really simple. So if you want your employees to own the business, there's only about six. And if you want your citizens to have an ownership of the business, there's about six. And if you want your employees and your citizens to have ownership, there's about three. And then it becomes really easy. So we have something that was invented specifically for public sector work, the kinds of work you're doing, called the, com the Community Interest Company. And it was deliberately set up to create social enterprises in public service. We're not one of those. But there are 20,000 of those in the UK in five years as a result of that law. We had a long, long conversation about what it was we wanted to be with our staff. And after hours and hours and hours of meetings, we got to within five minutes of the end of a meeting and one of our staff said, a community interest company. I don't like the word company. It feels very private sector. It feels very cold, very exclusive, not very caring, not pink and fluffy, as we would say in the UK. There is then another set of laws called a community benefit society. And this member of staff said, society, that feels a better word. That feels what we're about. It's, it's pink and fluffy. It's inclusive. It's warm. It's about care. So we became a community benefit society. That's what we are in law. We have a regulator, a national regulator, the same one that regulates banks. Every one of our staff is an owner. Now, they don't have to be. They, if you, actually, most of my colleagues and my other social enterprise colleagues, you choose whether you want to be an owner. And you pay a euro, and you become a shareholder. One euro, and it's a limited liability, so there's no risk where they lose their euro. We don't do that. What I do is I pay their euro, and I say, you are automatically an owner. Because what I'm worried about is if staff choose not to become an owner, 
are they really signed up to those values I showed you several slides ago? Whereas if you know you're an owner, you don't have a choice about the values. Either you sign up to our values or you go and work somewhere else. So every member of staff is an owner. A community benefit society means that we're allowed to benefit not just our members, and that's not our reason for being, is not to make it better for our staff, that's part of it, but it's because if we have better staff, then they perform better and they deliver better quality care. But also that we want to benefit our communities. So we have community members, and I'll show you that in a minute. That we have social objectives. We can have a charity, and in fact we've now got a charity. So we have businesses underneath businesses. So that if one gets, you know, out of those 35 businesses, if one of them goes, Bleh, it doesn't bring everybody else down. We can protect it. We don't subsidise it either forever. We'll subsidise for a while as long as we can see where it's going. But if a business really doesn't have a future, we'll let it go. We have something called an asset lock. And I was trying to explain an asset lock last night and I'm not sure I got this right but what an asset lock means is we are now claimed to be a successful business that's why you very kindly invited me to your beautiful country because we're successful well we might think we're so successful that a really big private company thinks we'll have some of that so we'll go and buy Care Plus Group out and we'll offer all those members 20,000 euros to sell the business well they can't it's not allowed in law. We have an asset lock. We cannot sell or give away any of our business. It belongs to the staff and it belongs to the community and that's enshrined in law. So we can't make a mass profit and disappear. Equally, we can't pay dividends. So we haven't got shareholders. We have shareholders, but they're not getting a share. What those shareholders are are the staff and they get a say. They have ownership. They have control. They have power. And we can and have offered our shares to a wider community. And it's one member, one vote, no matter who you are. So whether you're me as chief executive, I have one vote. And my vote is worth no more than a cleaner's vote or a nurse's vote. But equally, our community votes are worth the same as our employee votes. And I'm really clear, there are no employees, actually, in Care Plus Group, except one, me. So I am employed by 820 people, in fact, nearly 1,000 people, to run their business for them. And if they don't like the way I do it, they can get rid of me. I am truly accountable to them. So if I, I'm free to make decisions and I'm free to come here, don't have to ask permission. We don't have a referendum on what kind of toilet roll we're going to use or you know, what colour we're going to paint the walls. We don't do, you know, it's not that level of democracy, but it is around I have to give them information. And if I don't give them information or they don't like the information, they can challenge that information and they can challenge me. So, this looks complicated, and it isn't. Um, so this is our group. And if we start from the bottom up, so we've got 800 meter members, and they have an advisory committee that is theirs. They own it, they run it, they meet regularly, and they talk about the business, and they come up with ideas, and they come up with worries, and they, they feed them back to me. But that advisory committee doesn't exist in law. So actually, they can come to me and say, we're really worried, Lance, about this. And I go, that's interesting, but I'm not going to do anything about it. And I can. But if they then take that issue to the Council of Members, the Council of Governors, which is the yellow box, that exists in law. And if the Council of Governors come to me and say, we've got a concern... I have to respond. I have a legal responsibility to respond. I don't necessarily have to do what they're telling me, but I have to tell them why I'm not doing it or that I'm going to do it. 
So that Council of Governors is elected. So there are eight employees on there, and they are elected by their peers. We have two elected politicians from our municipality. We have two doctors on there, because we do a lot of health care. We also have customers on there. So we have two... Actually, this slide's slightly wrong now. We have two volunteer customers, and we have two customer customers. Because what we created... was a system where we had two extra constituencies. So we now have 250 volunteers who are members, the same as a member of staff. Because without them, we can't survive. They deliver, in three of my services, they deliver three quarters of the service as volunteers for no pay because it's part of their community as citizens. So they ought to have a say. And the staff voted for that. I didn't tell them that's what we should do. The staff said the volunteers should have a vote. So we created a constituency for them. We also, because of the kinds of services we offer, we will be providing care to some people throughout their lives. And they, are, they require our services every day. And if something terrible was to happen to Care Plus Group, their services would disappear. And that would have a really detrimental, catastrophic event on their lives. So our staff said they need to have a say as well. So we have a customers section. So customers can be members. There's 250 of those. And the reason there's 250 is to make sure that 60% of the ownership of the business is always with the staff. So the staff always feel that they've just got that edge of control and they're not at risk of everybody just coming in and stamping all over them. And then we have the board. And you know what a board looks like, and, you know, you're bright people. So we have three executives, chief, of, chief executive, chief operating officer, finance director, and four non-executives. They are appointed by the council of governors, not me. And we are, the board is held to account by the council of governors. Um, and they can remove the board. And they can remove me. Um, so it works the other way around so although it looks hierarchical actually it should have been the other way up I've got music on now so it works like that so it's, it's a circle so we're feeding ideas into them they're feeding ideas into us and it's going around in a virtual circle all the time The best executive is one who has the sense enough to pick good people to do what he wants them to do and the self-restraint enough to keep from meddling with them while they do it. I love meddling. That's why they send me to Riga. <laughs> it gets me out of the way and I stop interfering. So what's different? We have freedom to do what we want to do today without having to go and ask. And I don't have to go and ask. But we know that those rules are there. Really sadly, just as I accepted the invitation to come here a few weeks ago, a 29-year-old lady in Grimsby, who is a Latvian citizen, died of cancer. Uh, she'd been in the UK for four years with her husband and her daughter. Um, they'd worked, they'd contributed, they'd been real excellent members of our community. But sadly she died, and they had no money at all for a funeral. At all. We paid for it. Now, I didn't have to go and ask anybody's permission. I don't have to go and have a committee. I just get told the story, and we go, we're doing it. And I haven't been criticised for doing that by anybody. Actually, since I agreed that I'd pay for the funeral, the British government has paid for most of it, and we've just picked up the rest. But we have supported our Latvian colleagues. But we can just take decisions like that. When we were in the public sector, I think, you know, those are difficult decisions, and there's committees, and there's paper, and there's... We just took a decision. And we do that all the time. 
We have a really different relationship with our commissioners. So, so from the municipality's point of view, they've got to be really, really careful that you know, you've got less money than you had three years ago to spend in Riga and in Latvia. So you've got to be really careful that it gets used right and it's not getting going off anywhere or whatever. A social enterprise makes that really, really easy because they know that I'm not getting paid a silly salary. My staff are not getting paid ridiculous salaries. We are not paying shareholders. Every single euro we receive goes back into care. Yes, it pays for salaries, but sensible salaries. But that we're not in this to get rich. We're in this to do what's right. And the municipality can see that and understand that. I speak to my municipality, my elected members, my officers every day. And they now come to us and say, we've got a problem in our municipality. Is social enterprise a way of sorting that out? Since we started four years ago, we, are, we now have lots of social enterprises in our town of Grimsby to the point where it's about, uh, we worked it out, about 90 million euros is being spent in social enterprises by the municipality because that's the way we can deliver good quality care good quality services and we're looking at all sorts of services now we're looking at street cleaning cemeteries all sorts of things because we can help because we've got an infrastructure so we're a group it means that we can put a service in and look after it they can concentrate on what they're doing our grounds maintenance people are really great at cutting grass but they don't know a lot about accounts and why should they we can do all that. So we're getting into broader roles. We have opportunities then to work with all sorts of people doing all sorts of things. So we've got partnerships with our medical people. We've got partnerships with our university. We've got partnerships with our hospital. We've got partnerships with our housing provider. Because when I'm trying to get nurses to move to Grimsby, our housing trust helps me provide housing for people to come. I went out with a community nurse a few weeks ago and we went to see an old man who had cancer and he had no heating in his house. Um, it was really, really cold. A bit like here yesterday. <laughs> really cold. Um, and I ran the housing... While I was sat in this man's house, I text the chief executive of the housing trust and they put him central eating in within a week. We didn't have to go and ask anybody. We didn't fill in any paperwork. We just, I just sat there going, here is a need, and he went away and filled it. And we do that every day. It gives them that sense of ownership. I get emails from staff every day saying, I've had an idea, or could we do, or will you look at. really good example is a young administrative clerk who sits in one of our facilities. Uh, we're in 35 facilities as well, so we're spread all over. And she said, in my job, all these invoices come and sit on my desk, and I process them, and they, I, they go away again. And when I noticed that the same dairy, dairy, yeah, milk provider, was charging us three different prices in the same facility. So she rang round and got a better price. She didn't ask for permission. She wasn't saying to me, this is a problem, let's go and sort it. She was saying, have sorted it. And I said, no, no, stop. Because as a result of that, we looked at all our invoices for milk, and we saved 80,000 euros a year just by that one email from one very, very junior member of staff making us have a look at an issue. I was panicking then, I've done something wrong. And they know that if they want to change something, if something doesn't work, they change it. And it's that simple. And then they tell me they've changed it. Thank you. So they just change things, because they can. Because that's where the power is. It's not here. My job is to enable them to do their, the right thing. We don't worry about the money. That's not their job. I don't pay really good carers and nurses to worry about money. I pay them to do really, really good care. 
it's my job to worry about the money. So if they want to, if they've got, we, ha we had a lady a couple of weeks ago, an 86-year-old lady with dementia who broke her neck. She fell downstairs and she broke her neck right at the top. And it's really, really dangerous, if you don't know, to break that part of your neck. But because she got dementia, she kept taking the collar off. She wanted to get up and go shopping. She wanted to just, because we couldn't get her to understand how important it was. So we had to create a really, really difficult package just to know how to look after this lady 24 hours a day, and we needed to actually get her home because the one place where she was less confused was at home. And so we just did it, and it's cost quite a lot of money. But we didn't worry about that. We worried about what, did, what was in her best interests. And then I go to the commissioners and the municipality and say, this is what we needed to do, this is why we've done it, this is what it's cost, but if we hadn't done that, it would have cost you this. And she'd still be not very well. We offer value for money. Because our members know the answers. Whereas if you're in a big state system, like your health system, then people in central government and that think they know best. And by the time it gets to actual care, it's a mess. Whereas we do it the other way around. So our staff say what's best, and then we make it work. We are still part of the national system when it suits us. So you will see on the top right-hand corner in our logo, we still use the National Health Service logo because we have, still have a state contract. And that gives a degree of security to the, to the citizens. They feel better for that. So when it suits us, we're in the National Health Service. Then when the National Health Service comes out with a load of bureaucracy and silly forms and whatever, we say, no, we're not part of you anymore, so we don't have to do that. And we just concentrate on what we're doing. We can share infrastructure and we can share costs. If, if you've got a brilliant idea about how to run a social enterprise, about an idea about something you want to do, whether it's sell chocolate or run a stall out here in the beautiful old town that's going to make things better for people, maybe for people with a disability. I want you to be able to concentrate on that idea 100%. I don't want you worried about rent. I don't want you worrying about job contracts or procurement law. EU procurement law. It's as bad in the UK as it is here. Horrible. Um, I don't want you to worry about that. I want you to worry about setting up your new business. And my job, our job, is we can help you. We can be your parent. So we will bring you under our wing and look after you and support you and make sure that your tax return goes in while you build your business. And then when you become really successful, you can just say, don't need you anymore, Lance, bye-bye. And that's fine. But we create that system. And we can share costs. So if you're a new little business, you know, you've got to pay for the accountant and you've got to get your legal costs and you've got to pay for all that, and it's really expensive. And that makes setup costs really high. But I've got lawyers, I've got accountants, I've got human resources experts. You can have all them for nothing, because I'm paying them anyway. I don't need to employ loads more to, do, to look after you as well. So we can build and build and build. Samaritans do that all the time. Benefits, we provide cars to our staff, whether they need them or not. So we help them buy cheap cars because we're a big company. So we can get really good deals on cars. So people who couldn't normally get a car, we can get them a car. Also, because of our size, we can get them really cheap insurance on those cars. We provide childcare subsidised. The state doesn't. We provide gyms cost subsidised. The state doesn't. We provide savings schemes. So we have got our own, you understand credit unions, yes? We have our own credit union for staff and for our customers. So we've created our own credit union so that they can borrow money. We're looking at, instead of paying people pensions, um, I don't know what it's like in Latvia, but in the wow. UK, owning your home is a big deal. Not renting. Renting's just a lot, a lot of money and you don't get anything back. People want to own their own homes, but to do that, they need a big deposit. 
So what we're doing now for some of our employees is saying we won't bother with your pension for a couple of years if you're really young and you've got a young family. We will help you buy your home. So we will pay the deposit on your home and we will guarantee that with the bank. You just make the repayments. The state can't do that. It's not allowed to, but we can. And we've got really good... I don't know what it's like here. I forgot to ask how much annual leave you get but our staff get a lot of annual leave and for some of them it's too much so they're saying can I actually have money instead and for some of them are grandparents now and perhaps want a bit more they want to be able to buy that that you don't want so we buy and sell annual leave within the business we don't believe that we have competitors now that might just be that As I did say earlier, I am a nurse and therefore I'm pretty naive on business. But as far as I'm concerned, everybody else who delivers care or delivers services in our town is a provincial partner, not a competitor. There is an opportunity for us to work together, whether that's in housing, whether that's an electrician, whether that, whatever it is, there's an opportunity. As long as they share our values, then we will work with them. And you need to get that balance right about how that works. But it helps with the respect. So our providers, my colleagues in the other parts of the providers in our town, really respect Care Plus Group and what we're trying to achieve. Don't see us as a threat. Don't mess, we don't mess in their business. They don't mess in ours. And you just have to be really realistic about what you're good at. And if we're not good at something, I will hand it on to a competitor who I think might be able to do it better. And I'm hoping we'll get to the point where they start to hand them back to me. And we're just getting there. A social enterprise is driven by the best interests of the community. A social entrepreneur will always be bold, aspirational, and ambitious because their prime purpose is to change the world. I really want to change the world for the better. Uh, But I'm not naive enough to think I can do that on my own. So I started small and I started in Grimsby. Um, By the way, Penny Newman, she sells chocolate. Thank you. Ko tagad izskatās, ka ir laiks jautājumiem, un lai uzdotu jautājumu, tātad piespiežam vidējo pogu, un tad var runāt. Un tad, kad beidzam jautājumu, tad lūdzu izslēdzam, ja tad nākamais cilvēks nevarēs ieslēgt. Ja, paldies. Please, microphone. She's on. I have a question regards the budget of your enterprise. What is the share of uh, government budget, uh, municipal budget, and uh, the costs uh, or share which pays the customers? 99% state. 1%. But, but moving... So, so getting more, it was, it, it's customers more and more wanting to buy from us directly. And also, we have like personal budgets, like you have something similar. So the state, the municipality, gives the money for the care to the citizen to buy it from whoever they want. Okay. And then they, we want them to hope they'll buy it from us. And that's growing. So it's 99% or 1%, but it's going that way. So more and more, the citizens will pay for their services from from the state money. There's a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, um, I don't believe that uh, in, if you have 800 staff, that all staff is perfect, good, and uh, like, in, or, or you live in heaven. So sometimes happens that you need to change the staff or the staff is not so, not so good at the position they are. But if they are the ownership, uh, what is the procedure of what is uh, done and how you can change uh, or, or say, uh, thank you for your job, <laughs> it was great, but uh, you are uh, not welcome anymore. 
and uh, second will be after this. Um, so, just because they're an owner does not guarantee them a job. Um, so, if they are not delivering to the quality that we require, we have employment law the same as Latvia, and there are ways that we can help them to leave nicely. Um, if we ended up where we cannot, and it's just happened, where the municipality has had to cut our service cost a lot, so our drug services have been, their budget has been cut by 50%, we will have to make some of those owners redundant. But there, and we do that with a very, very heavy heart and reluctantly, but sometimes we have it to do. Those rules are just the same whether they're owners or not. Um, yes, there's a conversation then about have I made the right decisions and they can hold me to account and go, we, you know, six staff have lost their jobs. Um, in four years, we've never made anybody redundant until now. So all the way through the recession, we've not made anybody redundant. Redundant? Ivan, we're okay? Okay. So we've not made anybody redundant until today and in the next few weeks. And I'm, I'm really, really sad and upset about that. Um, and, but the staff can ask me why. And I have to stand in front of them and say why. <laughs> Your second point, sir. Es satvainojos jūs droši varat uzdot arī jautājumus latviešu valodā, ja? Un tie no pēdējām rindām, kam nav varbūt mikrofons, tad lūdzu izmantojiet aizmugurējos, pienākot klāt un uzdodot. Paldies. The second question would be about the profit. Uh, I suppose you have a profit, and there is a question about how you uh, decide on what to spend it and uh, what is a what is the, the things or what is the points where you spend the profit? That's a really interesting question. Um, when we talk to big corporate businesses like, um, I know they exist here, Deloitte or um, PwC or the big accountancy firms, Ernst Young, they always say you should keep enough money in the bank surplus to be able to cover three months employment costs just in case your people don't pay you so you can still pay your wages that would mean we would need to sit on having the bank in in reserve uh, seven million euros i can't sit here <laughs> stand here as a provider of care knowing that i've got seven million euros in the bank just in case things go wrong that i should be spending on care can't do it so our surplus today is about 350,000 euros on 28 million and that's a scary place to be because if something massive happens to us or we get a massive bill we haven't got far to go but at least we know we've invested in that care now when what we then do with that 350,000 is the staff can come forward with their ideas about how they might want to spend that. And so we do stuff so we will do proof of concept. So a member of staff might come up with an idea that we think's really good but would be the municipality or the health service can't understand how it'll work or will it work or it's a bit of a risk. We will fund that service for the first 6 months or a year out of our own savings, prove that it works, and then go to the municipality and, and what are, with the outcomes and the results and the savings to say, this is what our idea was, this is what it cost us, these are the savings we can create for you, and then we ask them to fund that. So we do things like that, but they come from ideas from the staff. Does that answer your question, sir? One more question. Uh, you uh, started your enterprise already being in system, and of course your enterprise is quite complicated and, uh, uh, now. Uh, taking into account your experience, uh, could you say if you start now, but not being in system, uh, which kind of services or which part of uh, uh, you suggest or you would try to, to do? You can do it with anything. 
And when you look at Andreas and Samaritans, he started with one contract and he's now huge, 20 years on. Um, I didn't mean that, you know. But he's, you know, they're a four million, four, four million pound, four million euro business. Um, so they've grown and grown and grown. So there are always ideas in care that you can grow. Most social entrepreneurs start with a seed of an idea and all they aim to do is grow a tree. You're absolutely right, madam. I started with a forest. But that means for me to look after another tree is easy. So my job is also to look after the other trees as well as look after my forest. And we try to do that. But you're right, we are looking at how we grow new businesses and I think, and we're growing all sorts of things. So we're getting involved in, we've grown our own IT company. Because we had some, we knew some young engineers locally who were really, really good. And we knew that we could sell a product. Um, I don't know what it's like in Latvia, but public services IT in the UK is rubbish, usually. Most people hate computer experts because all they do is switch it on, switch it off, reboot. <laughs> we loved ours. We had a really, really good product. So we've created our own company and we're now selling that outside of the area. And then the money that we can, and we can make good money from IT and then we bring that money back and we use that to subsidize some of our care so that we can run our care costs lower but still pay our staff well. And we're beginning to do that. And I'm going to a meeting next week to look at delivering elderly care in China because they've got loads of money. And we're looking, at, we're looking at Saudi Arabia because there is no elderly care in Saudi Arabia. They don't know how to do it. Well, we do, and you do. So there are opportunities to actually create small companies in places that have got plenty despite the recession, and then use the surplus from that to bring back, to invest back in our own, amongst our own citizens. So those are the kinds of things, that's my objective for this year. Kā jūs domājat, vai par sociālo uzņēmēju varētu kļūt pašvaldības uzņēmumi, kas apgādā iedzīvotājs ar komunāliem pakalpojumiem un siltumu. Ja jums, jums Anglijā to dara biznesa kā, kā biznesu, jeb kā sociālā uzņēmēja darbība? Paldies. Uh, yes, that's a really good question. Um, in the UK, there are four very big uh, energy companies that are private and are making obscene amounts of money uh, from energy. But there are now two social enterprises that are setting up in competition to sell that energy to the public cheaper. So yes, we have got energy companies doing that. Also, one of the things we're trying to do in Grimsby is because of our size and because we're now spending so much across all the social enterprises, is that we are going to buy our energy collectively and then sell it to our citizens cheaper or get it so that our citizens pay less for, because they're using our scale to get a better price. And we buy it for the whole of the city. Um, and we negotiate on behalf of all the citizens and then get that cheaper. So we've got photovoltaic arrays, I managed to say it, on our roof that are providing all our electricity, but more than we need. So we're now trying to get that electricity used for some old people's dwellings down the road. And we're beginning to do more and more of that. Is that okay? Un jautājums, kādi jūs redzat savu uzņēmumu pēc desmit gadiem, ja kādas jums ir nu, attīstība šie plāni, šie mērķi perspektīvā? D 
That's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't thought that far ahead, and that's perhaps because I'm a nurse and not a businessman. Um, I think, going back to the lady's point, the only way we will be bigger... I don't want to grow massive. So I, big is not beautiful. Big is clunky, cumbersome, and, and just stops being effective. So we will be lots of small pieces under that umbrella... So Care Plus Group will look, off, look after lots of smaller pieces, and some of them will go off and do their own thing, and then we'll bring new ones on. I think, going back to the lady's point, we will be working abroad. If we're going to bring in more investment and more money, we need to work overseas. Not so much, um, I would like to work here in Latvia, and, but not to make money here, but to do good things here. But make money from China, you know, Saudi Arabia, where they've got lots of it, not, not places like you. And I work with the Greeks. I'm doing some work with Greece. I'm doing some work with the French um, around how we try to work those things together. So I think we will become international, but still quite small. And we will be very uh, respectful and responsive to the needs of the small communities we work with. It won't all look the same. It'll look different. It would look different in Latvia. If, if we were creating what we do today here, it would look different in Latvia, because it should, because as a citizens, you're different, your country's different, so, so we wouldn't make it look like us. We'd work with you to make it look like you want it to look like. So, so I don't see us being big. We may be, I don't know, 10 years' time, maybe 40 million euro, but not huge and not all over the UK. Man ir jautājums šāds, kādi ir valsts atbalsti instrumenti sociālam uzņēmumu Lielbritānijā? Jūs teicāt, kad jums ir tiesības nodarbināt brīvprātīgos, piesaistīt brīvprātīgos, vai jums ir vēl arī kaut kāds īpašās nodokļa atlaids, ja piemēram pašvaldība jums bez maksas iznomā vai iedod telpas lietošanā? Kāds ir tās tie labumi, ko jūs vēl saņemat no valsts? I think that was six questions. Um, Okay. Um, social enterprises get no added benefits from being a social enterprise in the state. So we pay tax the same as everybody else. We pay corporation tax, value-added tax, the same as everybody else. So there are no tax advantages. Um, there are if you are a charity. So we have a charity. So we run stuff through our charity because it doesn't pay tax. So we have a charity for some of the bits where we can get the best deal on tax. We put things in the charity. And the charity is sort of at arm's length, but it's part of the family. Does that make sense? Um, so we run that separate, but it's all under that umbrella. Um, yes, there are advantages for us in that um, if our municipality has got buildings that it doesn't need anymore or are run down and it can't afford to do them up, I can ask for them, and I can either pay a market rate, but in a town as deprived as ours, there isn't really a market. Uh, so if I showed you our new headquarters, it's huge, and I didn't pay a lot for it because it wasn't worth a lot in our town. It would be in Riga, um, but it wouldn't be, or in London, it would cost millions and millions, and it didn't. It cost me a couple hundred thousand. But equally, we have a law in, in the UK called uh, Community Asset Transfer, where the municipality is allowed in law, where a building has no real value, mun corporate value, commercial value, to give it to the community. Just hand it over. And we can do that. So we're doing that now. We're in negotiations to take over a school, an empty school. It's been empty for four years. It's huge, and it's got loads of land. We can't knock it down and build houses on it and make loads of money on it, but we can use it as part of our community, and we do that all the time. So if I take you to our headquarters, we've got a beautiful new headquarters. Not as beautiful as this, but it's beautiful for us but it's in the heart of the really poorest area of our town. Um, but it's part of the community. So on Sunday, it's a church. 
they hold church, church services in our headquarters. It's a Buddhist temple. Different room. <laughs> um, it's got a whole bank of computers that anybody from the community can walk in off the street and use a computer. And we will help them. And we will teach them. We can help them get housing. We can help them get... Um, we have a creche so that they can, we can do childcare. It has a cafe that's run by them, not by us. So two ladies from the community are running a cafe. And because there's so many of our staff in, they're making quite a good deal at the minute. They're, they've done very well out of us moving in. But it belongs to the community. And the municipality have now announced that it is what's called a community hub, even though it's ours and it belongs to us and it's, I'm paying the mortgage... It's now part of the community, and the community can walk through the door and ask for services. So we do that all the time. We, it's about us being embedded in our community, but in doing that, it means that yes, we can get deals on better deals on premises from the municipality. But otherwise, no, I don't ask for favours. So tendering procurement law is the same for us as it is for everybody else, but. What we do in those tenders is that we can put added value in. So, so we can add, add things that, that the private sector can't. So you know, yes, you can put out a tender through EU procurement law for Meals on Wheels, and it's just a meal. But if you remember what I said earlier, we deliver a meal and then an armful of extras. And our municipality understand that we bring added value to our community and through society. So they give us those contracts. But we have to win them the same way as everybody else. And I want to be able to win them fairly. I don't want special treatment because I'm a social enterprise. I want somebody to give me a contract because I'm better than the private sector, not because I'm a charity. Um, man ir jautājums. Um, paldies par jūsu fantastisko pieredzi un stāstījumu. Um, es gribēju jautāt par ISO kvalitātes standartu iegūšanu. Vai tā bija absolūta nepieciešamība, lai jūs varētu sniegt šos pakalpojumus cilvēkiem? Un kā mainījās uh, jūsu darbs pie šīs kvalitātes standartu iegūšanas? Paldies. The way I the, the reason that we are the first people to ever get the ISO standard is because the ISO process was set up originally for manufacturing. And when you try and apply that then in care, it's a nightmare. <laughs> and it's really, really hard. So we've had to change all our processes. We've had to change all our systems to become ISO compliant. Now, why did we do that, which is your question, is there is no requirement in UK tenders to be ISO because most of the public sector isn't. But therefore, because we are, it gives me that advantage when I go f f against competition. If I've got ISO and none of my competitors have, my commissioners understand that I have a quality framework that's been internationally recognised and makes me look good. So that's why we put ourselves through the pain, and it was pain. It was really, really hard work. Um, but it's now worth it. Um, so um, when we fill in a tender in the UK, and it's not that dissimilar, oh, Jews, the same for you, under the quality standards framework, if you haven't got one, you have to spend thousands of words explaining how you measure quality. All we now write is ISO 9001. And the commissioner automatically understands what our quality matrix is, and so that makes tendering easier for us. It was really, really hard work, and I wasn't convinced. I am now. There's a lady on the front. Paldies par jūsu stāstīm, un arī man būs divi jautājumi, varbūt, ka sanāks vairāk. Pirmais jautājums, kādā veidā klienti, jeb šie cilvēki, kuriem ir vajadzības nonākt līdz jums, 
Un vai jūs veidojat klientu lietu, kurā tiek fiksēts viss, kas tiek darīts. Otrs jautājums, kādā veidā jūs atskaitaties valstī vai pašvaldībai par izlietoto finansējumu? Un kādā veidā valstī pašvaldība kontrolē to? Paldies! No, um, absolutely not. Okay, sort of. Um, um, interpreter lady, can you give me that first bit again? Ah, yes, thank you. And then the finance question. Thank you. So, um, we promote ourselves enormously throughout the town. So, our logo and our badge is everywhere. It's on our vehicles, it's on everything. We also have something called a single point of access, a spa, not that kind of spa, a spa, single point of access which is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and it delivers social care, medical care, nursing care, any care. So you could ring that, um, you might ring that because a really good example would be that somebody's, a, a daughter has gone to visit her elderly relative and her relatives died. And they ring us and, and despair, and we know what to do. But equally, she might go and just think her mum's not as well as she might be and needs some assistance, and she would ring us, and we would go and assess that person, both health and social care, and put a package of care in to help her to look after herself. Equally, it does happen, um, we have uh, a, an elderly lady who rang us, she was 95, lives completely independently, no care, everything's fine, to say her cooker was broken. Okay. Yeah. We had that repaired in 30 minutes. Because if she can't pre prepare a meal for herself, then in five, six days' time, she will become a problem, and she will end up with a lot of more needs than just getting her cooker fixed. So we can get anything fixed. The second part of your question is, we, uh, and, and we're going to share with the foundation our quality and performance data that we produce every quarter, so every three months we produce reams and reams of reports about what we're achieving. And they go to the municipality, they go to the National Health Service to say this is what we're doing. And they set us targets. But what we've learned to do in the last few years is that they set us outcomes, not inputs. Are you familiar with, are you okay with that, madam? You understand what I'm saying? So we don't say, what do you want me to do with this lady? What we get them to say is, how, how do you want that lady to be in five months' time or a year's time? Do you want her to, to be better? Then how we get there is our business. What services we put in, how they work, becomes our business. They don't, the municipality doesn't dictate what we have to offer. What it dictates is what outcomes and results they want at the end, and we have to make sure we receive them. The second part of your question was really interesting because when we first went live, the municipality assumed we would run a separate ledger and accounts for social care, and a separate ledger and accounts for health care, and a separate ledger and accounts for private care. We don't. We run one set of accounts. So if I'm caring for your relative, what you see is that your relative is better. What you don't see is who paid. And you don't see whether the municipality paid or the health service paid. All you see is the outcome. And all the municipality see is the outcome. They don't see whether I used health money or social care money or private money. They just see that I delivered what they asked me to deliver. Does that answer your question? Well, 
pasūtien, paldies jums par jūsu atbildēm. Vai jūs un jūsu uzņēmumu darbinieki piedalās sociālā biznesa attīstības inkubātoros mentoringā, mentorship, lai palīdzētu attīstīties un dalīties pieredzē ar citiem līdzīgiem uzņēmumiem apvienotajā karalistē un citur pasaulē? Paldies! Um, yes, and it sort of goes back to the question I was asked earlier, that um, the state of the UK made a small amount of money available for incubation of social... When they first decided they wanted social enterprise in the way that you're having those conversations now, they made some initial seed corn money, set up money available, small amount. I mean, not, you know, compared to the size of the business that helped us get the legal costs and all that kind of stuff. I am also now what's called, I am a social enterprise and mutuals ambassador for the British government. And there are 15 of us. And if you ring our government, so if, if a, somebody, a citizen like you has an idea and you ring the government and say, how do I set up a social enterprise? You will be sent to me. And I will help you in any way I can. And I, have, I see that as my responsibility. But equally, as a citizen of the world, I see myself as a responsibility to help my colleagues here in Latvia who asked me to come and support them. Um, and I do that in Greece. So in Greece, the infrastructure, I know you've got problems here, but compared to Greece, Greece's social care is just gone. So I'm working with some social to try to create some new social enterprises in Greece for the EU as part of the Greek task force because I see that I have a responsibility. My state, the, the UK government, were kind enough to invest in helping me to do what I do. And I now feel I have a duty to my citizens across the world that if I can give that back, repay that, that then I will do so. If I can just add, one of the things I think that sets social entrepreneurs apart from everybody else is we never say no. So I have never ever been asked for help and said no and I have never ever met a social entrepreneur in the world and I've worked in India and I've done work with Indians and the Americans and the South Africans. Every social entrepreneur I've ever rung and asked for help has said yes, what do you need? And I think that's what sets us apart and it's part of our values and our principles in the way that people like Andreas does here, and you've got other colleagues here in the room who I know, you know would freely give their time. I freely give you mine. Skatoties pulkstenī, varbūt vien divus pēdējos jautājumus, lūdzu. Labdien, paldies par jūsu stāstījumu. Mēs jūtu, ka jūs ļoti, ļoti mīlat savu pilsētu. Cik tad ir tā pilsēta liela, cik jums iedzīvotāji, tur un cie sociāli uzņēmumi jūs minējāt savu uh, apjomu, kā jūs veicat darbu, uh, vai ir vēl citi sociāli uzņēmumi jūsu pilsētā, vai varbūt var pateikt, cik procentuāli no kopējā uzņēmumi sabiedrība un komersantu skaita ir sociāli uzņēmumi Liebritānijā vai kaut kādā reģionā, un kāda ir tā tendence? Tas būs pirmais jautājums, un jūs jau minējāt uh, par saprātīgām algām. Tās jūs attiecībā savā uzņēmumā vērtēt no tā atbildības, <laughs> un cik viņas elastīgas ir īstenībā. Jo tas augu jautājums jau mērķi diezgan stiepjams, iedziens, no vienas puses raugoties, vienam par daudz liekas devējam, saņēmējam par maz. Kā jūs šo jautājumu noregulējat? Paldies. <laughs> um, I really like that one. Um, so um, we serve about 180,000 people, but it's really dense population. It's not like Latvia. It's not even like, what well, I suppose it is like Riga. We have, in, in our town of Grimsby, there are 8.2 people per hectare. Across the UK, there are 2.7 people per hectare. Grimsby has a denser population than London. Once you step outside of our municipality, our municipality from one side to the other is 18 kilometers round. Once you step outside, there is 
fields, arable fields and forests, for 50 kilometers. So it's tight and it's easier to define. Um, we don't need Andreas's care bus because <laughs> everybody's easy to get to. Um, I love the town I work in, but I don't live there. I live 100 kilometers away, and I have done for 10 years. And I went there for two years to do a project and never left. Uh, but equally, I didn't uproot my family either. So I travel 200 kilometers a day, every day, except when I come here. Um, so yes, but I do care. I care about this community because my view was that our society didn't. Uh, when we were doing some of the things we were doing, um, we needed to go and ask our state government for permission. And when we went to see a very, very senior politician, not the Prime Minister, but not far underneath, we needed permission to do something differently. And her response was, it's Grimsby. If it doesn't work, nobody will know and nobody will care. <laughs> well, we care, and we care a lot. And also, I'm very stubborn, so sto that's the other. Social entrepreneurs all say yes, don't understand the word no, and are as stubborn as mules. So when people tell me no, I go deaf, um, because that's not the right answer. And there's always a way. Uh, sorry, I've moved. Um, so they, um, there's always a way. Um, I can't remember the second part of the question. Oh, sorry. So across the UK, there are now um, uh, 100,000 social enterprises. And we, are, we make up a third of the GDP. But many of those are really tiny. Three, four people turning over 50, 60,000 euro. There are very few as big as ours. Uh, but the one that may surprise you and that you will all know, Latvians and Regans or whatever, is the big red buses you see in London. That's a social enterprise. Oh, salaries. Yes, I was ducking the hard one. <laughs> I was hoping the lady had forgotten. Um, we have to be commercial. I cannot pay my staff exorbitant salaries because the municipality don't get value for money. So I have to get that balance right. But equally, I will not pay minimum wage, ever, because it's immoral. It's just not fair. So we pay as much as we can and as much as we dare. My salary, we, we have, because we make up a third of the GDP, we are very honest. So we all run open books. So if you want to look at my accounts, you can. And we all do that. So we know what roughly what we're all getting paid. So, so we know what, what the tolerances are and the levels are around a chief executive of a business my size. We have lots of comparative data to work at that against. But I could go to the private sector and earn 10 times what I'm on today, um, but I'd rather die. Stits, ka vēl drošiem būtu daudz jautājumu, un es tiešām aicinātu kafijas pauzē, vēl izmantot iespēju gan pašiem apmainīties kontaktiem, gan vēl uzdot jautājumus, bet pirms tam liels, liels paldies, teiksim, kopā par šo brīnišķīgo lekciju. Un, jā, un ceram satikties vai nu atkārtot vēlreiz Latvijā vai varbūt arī citā valstī. Paldies! Un, Paldies. Un pavisam pēdējais gan konferences video ieraksts, gan prezentācijas, domāju, ka mēs izsūtīsim tātad uz ēpastiem, kas ir norādīti reģistrācijās un varēs arī ievietot mājaslapās Soros fonda un droši arī mūsu labklājības departamenta.
Ja, vēlreiz paldies.